I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. A uh, special call out to NAMI. I'm a lifetime member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And it was so nice meeting so many advocates before we started this. And thank you for coming out. I'm the parent of a son with serious mental illness. What does that mean? What does it feel like? It means that I know what it's like to see someone who I've known from the moment of their birth and not recognize them to see a stranger in my son's body, completely alien to me. What does it mean? It means I'm the subject of whispers. An apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You see someone with mental illness, as one mental health professional told me before he found out I had a son with mental illness, oh, just look at the parents and, and you'll see what's, what's wrong and what's causing this. What does it mean? It means that I've had to call the police on my son. I've watched my son get tasered. I've watched my son being taken to a police station, hogtied with his hands and feet chained behind his back and officers making fun of him and egging him on while he talked about how he was going to save Natalie Portman. What does it mean? It means that his brothers and sisters have accused me of, of favoring him of enabling him, of protecting him, coddling him, and experts saying, oh, just let him hit rock bottom. What does it mean? It means I've had people who don't believe in psychiatry and say it's a social construct tell me I'm torturing my child by trying to get him treatment. What does it mean to be the parent of an adult son with a mental illness? It means trying to convince your son, and I'm very fortunate because my son reacts well to medication, trying to convince him to take medication and then having an insurance company say, oh, we're not going to pay for that drug, or even worse, having a psychiatrist say to him, well, I'll give you that medication, but it's a placebo, and I've never known it to help anyone else. What does it mean? It means having your heart broken as you hold your sobbing son in your arms, and him saying to you, I just want to be normal, Dad, and having everyone around him say, you're not normal, we will not rent you an apartment, we will not give you a job, we will not let you date anyone we know because you have a mental illness. I know every one of those feelings because I've experienced them with my son, Kevin. My first hint that something was wrong was when Kevin was in college. He was attending the Pratt Institutes in New York, and I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and we called every Sunday, and on this particular Sunday, he said to me, Dad, Dad, food doesn't taste good. I said, what? And he hung up the phone, and I called him back, and he said, Dad, Dad, I think I took five homeless people to breakfast this morning, but I'm not sure. And I said, well, tell me. And he hung up the phone. And I called him back and I said, what's going on? Dad, Dad, I'm not sure that I'm not dreaming this. I can't tell the difference between reality and my dreams. Well, I immediately raced to New York and my wife Patty called and we actually found a psychiatrist willing to see us. And I took him over there. My son went willingly. And we went over and the psychiatrist talked to him for a few minutes and he came out and he said, Mr. Early, if you're lucky, your son is using drugs. And if he's not, he has a mental illness. Lucky if my son is using drugs? Well, blood test showed he wasn't using drugs. So that doctor called us in and he said, look, <clears throat> I'm not one of these people who's going to sugarcoat this. Your son has an incurable illness, bipolar disorder. He will never get better. He will have to take strong medications the rest of his life. They will make him gain weight. They will probably keep him from getting a job. Don't even think about getting married. And he may end up homeless. He could be on the street. And oh yeah, people with mental illness die 15 to 25 years before everyone else. Can you imagine how I felt when I left that office and I turned to Kevin and he looked at me and he goes, Dad, that guy's crazy. <laughs> you know, my wife was recently diagnosed with kidney cancer. What did we do? We looked at all the odds, the things, and we said, we're going to be, well, my son did the same thing. He said, I'm not going to be one of those homeless people on the streets. I don't have a mental illness. Well, he took medication, it helped him, and after about two months, he stopped taking it, and I was so ignorant, I thought, well, you have a headache, you take aspirin, and, you know, when it goes away, you quit taking it. 
This was a failed opportunity to educate me and also to engage my son. Flash forward, 12 months later, I get a frantic call from his older brother. He says, come quick, come quick. Kevin is crazy, and I drove to New York, and my son had been wandering around the street for five days. He'd barely slept. He'd hardly eaten. He was convinced that God had him on a special mission. And I convinced him to get in the car and I drive as fast as I can down to Fairfax County. And during that car ride, he would laugh one minute and he'd begin sobbing the next. And I pleaded with him to take his medication. And he screamed, pills are poison, leave me alone. And we got to the emergency room and the intake nurse is rolling her eyes while Kevin's telling her about it, how God has him on this special mission. And then we were shown to a room away from everyone else to wait all by ourselves and we waited and we waited and we waited and after four hours my son said there's nothing wrong with me i'm gonna leave and i said hang on son hang on and i literally went out and grabbed a doctor and i will never forget how that doctor came in that room he came in with his hands up as if he was surrendering and he said i'm sorry mr early i can't help your son i said you haven't even examined him and he said it didn't make any difference. At that time in Virginia, the law was very clear. Unless a person posed an immediate, imminent danger to themselves or others, they couldn't be required to undergo any kind of treatment. And the nurse had told him that my son thought all pills were poison. And the fact we'd been sitting there for four hours meant that there was no imminent danger. So he looked at me and he says, you know, Mr. Lee seemed like a concerned father. You bring him back after he tries to hurt you or kill someone else. Another missed chance at engagement, at getting us in. Well, I took my son home, and during the next 48 hours, I saw him get sicker and sicker. At one point, he had tinfoil wrapped around his head to keep the CIA from reading his thoughts. He slipped out of my house. He slipped out. He broke into a stranger's house. Thank goodness no one was home. It was Labor Day weekend. He broke in to take a bubble bath. It took five police officers to get him out. And all of a sudden, my son had become a criminal justice statistic. One of the 2.2 million people with serious mental illnesses who are booked in our jails every year. One of the 367,000 with serious mental illness sitting in our jails and prisons. One of the more than 1 million on probation every year. 40% of persons with serious mental illness will have an encounter, a serious encounter with law enforcement. 49% of police shootings involve persons with serious mental illness. Persons with serious mental illness are 16 times more likely to be shot by the police. They stay in jails and prisons four to eight times longer, charged with identical crimes as someone else. They have a higher likelihood while they're in jail of being charged with other crimes. And persons with serious mental illness cost seven to ten times more than anyone else. And the recidivism rate is 15% higher than the national average, 85% recidivism. And I'm not an expert on Seattle. I'm not an expert on Washington State. But I did a little digging as a reporter. And what I read was, if you have a breakdown right now in Washington State, like my son has, the chances of you ending up in jail or getting help are three to one in favor of going to jail. In November 2016, your state conducted an exhaustive study entitled Diversion of People with Mental Illness in Washington State. What did they find? Quote, Data suggests that people with mental illness are cycling in and out of Washington's criminal justice system, many of them without getting treatment. Quote, when people with mental illness are arrested, it's usually not for a violent behavior, but low-level nuisance crimes like shoplifting, trespassing, disorderly conduct, and theft, and if they've been arrested before for technical violations. Quote, once they are in jail, they are vulnerable to intimidation and assault. They may act out or break jail rules because the jail environment has exacerbated the symptoms and this behavior prolongs their incarceration. Well, what happened to my son and those kind of statistics made me want to do something. So I decided I'd go to my son and I said, I'm thinking about writing a book about you. And Kevin looked at me and he said, Who'd want to read that? I said, no, I'm going to find a jail far away from Fairfax County because I don't want to risk irritating a judge or a prosecutor. I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to follow people through the system out into the streets to see what happens to them. And then I'll come back, and I'll talk to the judge and the prosecutor and defense attorney and the correctional officers and the police and the parents. And he looked at me, and he said, Dad, if it helps someone else, 
tell my story. Well, I got talked my way into the LA County Jail, Twin Towers. I lasted two days before they threw me out claiming I was violating HIPAA. The truth was they didn't want me to see what was going on there. I tried Chicago next, they said no. Rikos Island, they said no. I tried Baltimore, they said no. I tried Washington DC, my hometown, and they said hell no. And I ended up going to Miami-Dade because of a judge down there who said, I want you to see what's going on in my jail. Let me take you there. The ninth floor, Miami-Dade Correctional Center. It suicide wing, 19 cells. It's a U-shaped cell block. The officers walk up and down the center. 19 cells, plexiglass fronts. And when you looked in those cells, you saw men completely naked in cells that had nothing else in them. Cells built for two or three people with four or five people in them. Because the plexiglass blocked the air conditioning, there were bone kill chilling cold, but there was no blankets. There were no blankets. And I'm gonna show you a video of this place and you will see that people on medication thirsty. It's an old jail, the water system broke down, so you see people drinking out of toilets. And I heard the normal sounds of men coughing and spitting and talking and jail doors closed. But when you listen closer, you could hear the asylum sound, someone screaming at an unseen tormentor. And then I heard a thud, thud, thud. Then louder, thud, thud, thud. Quicker, thud, thud, thud. It was an inmate smashing his forehead in the plexiglass. I ain't crazy, he screamed. Well, then quit acting like you are. The correctional officers who worked here called it the forgotten floor, and I thought, oh, that's because the inmates, and, and I'd spent 10 months there, I found out, no, it was, they were also talking about themselves. Not one of these correctional officers had any training to work with people with mental illness, and when I got to know them better, they all admitted to me that they were troublesome employees, their bosses wanted to get them fired, so they sent them to work with the crazies because it was the worst assignment in the jail. My tour guide was Dr. Joseph Poitier, a fabulous psychiatrist. He said to me, Pete, people think you get arrested, you get help. We don't help people in jail, we're not a hospital. I went with him on his morning rounds. There were 92 inmates on the ninth floor. His rounds took us 19 minutes. You do the math, you'll see we talked to each person 12 seconds. But Pete, these are criminals. They deserve to be locked up. Oh, do they? Let me introduce you to Alice Ann Collier, classic case, schizophrenia, the kind of person who used to be in a state hospital. Now she was back in the community. That's fabulous, but look where she lived. She lived in a cardboard box container behind a restaurant. When I checked her record, I'd found out she'd been arrested 10 times in the last four years and never had gotten any kind of help. And this time she was arrested because she was walking down the street and she saw an older woman waiting for a bus and she screamed, stop stealing my thoughts. And she ran up and she shoved the older woman, not hard enough to knock her over, but she shoved her and then went running away. And well-meaning witnesses came up and said, get that woman arrested. You get her arrested, she'll get help. Well, that's not what Alice Ann Collier received. Florida is unique because so many people retire there. They can charge any crime against someone over the age of 65 as a felony if they wish. And because Alice Ann Collier had shoved two other people at bus stops, she was charged as a felony and her third strike rule, which meant she faced a mandatory five years in prison. But when she was brought before the judge to be put on trial, he said, I can't put that, she's not competent, and you have to be competent in our country to be put on trial. You go to the state hospital in Chattahoochee and get made competent. Get made competent is not the same as treatment. Every day, Alice Ann Collier was taken into a room and she was shown three chairs. Now, one chair was written judge and another one defense attorney and a third one prosecutor. And when Alice Ann Collier could tell her keepers, who sat in each chair, a checkbox was made off, she was deemed competent, and she was sent back to the judge. Well, of course, she wasn't competent, and the judge looked down and said, I sent you off to Chattahoochee, you have made competent. Go back to Chattahoochee. When I discovered Alice Ann Collier in that jail, she'd been traveling between Chattahoochee and the jail 1,151 days, more than three years 
and she'd never been brought on trial. Now I'm a reporter, I got my little pen, I have a pencil, and I went running over to the prosecutor, look what I found, look what I found. And they told me with absolutely no embarrassment that they knew what they were doing with Alice Ann Collier. In fact, they planned to keep her for five years, which was the statutory maximum they could without putting her on trial. Why? She was dangerous, medications didn't seem to help her become stable, and there was no safe place, no treatment beds, no facilities, no place in the entire state of Florida to help her. So they were keeping her on that bus, riding her back and forth to keep her off the street. She was typical. I'm not talking about Hannibal Lecter serial killers. I'm talking about people with serious mental illnesses, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and persistent and major depression. Let me tell you about April Hernandez, same age as my son. I found about her because the correctional officers came up and said, you should get that woman, you should look at that woman's case. She was framed. I said, framed? Yeah, she was framed. Who framed April Hernandez? Her own parents had conspired with relatives to frame her for stealing a car. Why would parents frame their own child? Because she had schizophrenia, she was homeless, she was living on the streets of South Beach where she'd been gang raped twice and beaten up three times by teenagers who thought it was hilarious to beat up homeless people and there was nothing anyone could do because she was not considered a danger to herself or others and there was no outreach on those streets trying to help her. Now what's interesting about her case is when she was a teenager she began using drugs and everybody thought, oh, that's why she's doing that. And it was only when she was correctly diagnosed as having a co-occurring both drug addiction and mental health problem that they understood what was really going on. And we know that 40% of persons with bipolar disorder have serious mental illness and have a co-occurring problem and 70% of our people who are in jail and prisons have co-occurring problems. Let's talk about the last person I'm gonna mention, Freddie Gilbert. And I saw several Freddie Gilberts when I walked from the hotel over here tonight. A Miami study found that in a population of two million at any given time, there were 1,700 people who were living on the streets or they were homeless, sleeping in cars. But that same study found that of those 1,700 people, most were able to move through our social system into some kind of housing, except except for 507 individuals. They are the chronic homeless. They are always homeless. And Freddie Gilbert was one of those. They are always homeless. Every one of them has been arrested more than once, and every one of them had a co-occurring drug and alcohol problem. When I met Freddie Gilbert, he was so sick, he could not speak. He stood in his cell naked, and they controlled him by offering him sandwiches as if he were a dog performing for treats. And when I checked his record, I discovered Gilbert had been in and out of that jail more than a dozen times that year alone. But he was always charged with misdemeanors, and because of that, he could not be admitted into a treatment program. And he was just simply caught in the revolving door, jail streets, jail streets, jail streets. After my book was published, the University of Southern Florida's Mental Health Institute followed 97 people like Freddie Gilbert, people like the ones you see on your street. They followed them for five years. Every one of them had schizophrenia. Everyone was homeless. Now listen to this. These 97 individuals were arrested 2,200 times, spent 27,000 days in jail, 13,000 days in crisis stabilization units in emergency rooms, 13,000 days in emergency rooms. They cost the community $13 million and not one of them ever got any better. But Pete, you wrote your book in what, 2006, 2007? Surely things have gotten better. Yeah, they have. But let's not fool ourselves. Last year, Hampton Roads, Virginia, J. Shamil Mitchell, 24-year-old African-American, he gets arrested, he has, he has schizophrenia, he gets arrested, he gets taken to the jail. His paperwork is sent to the state hospital, there are no beds available, so he sits in that jail. And people forget about him until 101 days later when his body is found dead in his cell, walls covered with feces. What did Jay Shamil die from? 
He died from wasting away syndrome. He was literally starved to death by guards who thought they'd punish him by keeping food from him. Even though he was seen every day by a nurse, nothing was done. She noted in her records that he had gone from 178 pounds, he'd lost 46 pounds, and yet no alarm bells were raised. What was J. Shamil's Mitchell's crime? He had taken $5.05 worth of snacks from a 7-Eleven. How do we get in the situation where jails and prisons, as Ari said, have become our new mental health asylums? The biggest reason is we do not adequately fund community-based treatment. Not everybody in Miami is in the jail if you have a serious mental illness. There were 4,500 people with serious mental illness, the kind who used to be locked up in state prisons back in the community. There are 4,500 of them when I did my book. Let's look at where they lived. They lived in 650 boarding homes, assisted living facilities. That's great, we got them out there living in the, let's look at those 650 homes. Do you know that 400 of them, only 250 of them had passed the state licensing requirements to operate as a boarding home? In other words, in the other 400, if you tried to put somebody who didn't have a mental illness in that place, it would have been against the law. They were granted waivers because they needed beds. One of the homes I visited had a hole in the roof. Rain came through. Medications were scattered on the kitchen table. The, t uh, the person who ran the home only spoke Spanish. None of the tenants spoke Spanish. Meals were rice and beans. There was no treatment. There was no case management. All the people did was sat in front of a black and white TV smoking and watching TV. And I would argue in these cases, we haven't improved these people's lives. We're just hiding them better. Well, it's easy for me to criticize these slumlords. Let's do a little digging. When I did my research, every one of those people operated that home got $29.90 per patient per day. $29.90, take care of all their needs. Now, you can tell I'm from Washington because when I travel, I put my dog in the Dulles Executive Pet Center. They charge me $36 a day to walk my dog, feed my dog, give my dog its medicine. In other words, we're paying $6 a day more to take care of my dog than what we're paying people in Miami to take care of people with schizophrenia. That's why I call my book crazy. I'm not talking about people like my son. I'm talking about a disjointed, underfunded system that waits for people to get to stage four of their illness and then cobbles together a system of scraps. Because our mental health care system can't meet our needs, we're relying on the criminal justice system to solve it. Your state has become a national leader in police training. In 2015, your legislature passed a law that said all police officers must have training in how to deal with individuals with mental crisis. Two months ago, Seattle hosted the International Crisis Intervention Team Training, CIT convention, right here in your town. In addition to police training, 28 of your 39 counties have created problem-solving courts to try to divert people who are sick out into treatment rather than putting them through the criminal justice system. Remember that 2016 report about you? It quote, diversion has the potential to cut criminal justice costs, reduce recidivism, provide effective mental health treatment, and represent a more humane response. Unfortunately, Washington counties, law enforcement agencies, jails, courts, and health care providers do not have sufficient funds to divert people into treatment. Now look, what are we really talking about? Let's use some common sense. If I had a broken arm, I wouldn't call up the Seattle Police Department and say, hey, can you come fix it? If I needed heart surgery, I wouldn't call up your sheriff and ask her to come and do a heart transplant. And if I had nasty, nasty hemorrhoids, I wouldn't call up one of your judges and say, hey, judge, would you come over and take a look at this? So why are we depending on the police and the sheriff and judges to deal with what should be a community-based problem? We can't arrest ourselves out of this. If you want to reform our system, you have to take law enforcement and collaborate with community care. And the first place you got to start is with housing. 
How can you get better if you don't have decent housing and a roof over it? Then you have, do you know in progressive communities in California, the hospitals are actually paying for housing to keep people like Freddie Gilbert from recycling through their uh, emergency rooms? You need to wake up and you can't understand unless you want to fix your system, unless you want to talk about jobs, giving people opportunities. You can't fix it unless you want to talk about getting mental health professionals out in rural areas. You shouldn't have to drive five miles to 500 miles to see a therapist. You can't talk about mental health recovery unless you want to talk about transportation and getting people to those jobs and housing. You can't talk about it unless you want to talk about drug and alcohol treatment programs. You can't talk about it unless you want to talk about PTSD, 21 veterans a day dying from mental illness, untreated, taking their own lives. Did you know for the last three years more police officers have ended their own lives because of PTSD than have died in the line of duty? And you can't talk about it unless you want to talk about social connectivity and giving people meaning in their life and having peers, people with mental illness, help people and having clubhouses. And you can't talk about it unless you want to talk about giving people hope. That's right, hope. Writer Hal Lindsey said it best, man can live 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, and one second without hope. Well, how do I know that this is the answer? How do I know that collaboration with the police and community services and getting proper funding is the answer? Because let's go back to Miami. After my book was published, the judge down there, Lifeman, took it to the television station. I'm going to show you the video. And they did a big series and people have big hearts and they saw what was going on and they passed a bond issue. And it took him until last year to close down that jail. But he replaced it with a drop-in center and he had crisis intervention team trained police officers. It used to be if you spit at a policeman in Miami, you got charged with a felony assault. He changed it so the police officers now don't even charge someone with a mental illness if they shove them. That's incredible. And what has happened since he's closed that place down? Arrests have decreased from 118,000 to 56,000 annually. Recidivism dropped 50%. The jail population dropped from 7,300 to 4,000. And Miami actually was able to close one of its jails, saving $12 million. My goal is zero intercept. In Phoenix right now, they have what's called an air traffic plan, where you call a number, and that person is a trained professional and says, oh, you need to get this person immediately to this hospital. Oh, we can send out a mobile crisis response team. Oh, you just need to get this person to therapy. We'll arrange it for you. Voiding police contact altogether. How do I know collaboration works? I know because of my son, Kevin. For six years, my son was in and out of hospitals, in and out of getting arrested, tasered by the police. The last time he got sick was on Thanksgiving, and he could tell, I could tell he was off his meds, and he ran out and he jumped in the car, and he went shooting off, and I called, and I called, and I called, and finally he answered, I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to heaven. Well, that's not reassuring to a father. Four hours later, he called me. He'd run out of gas in North Carolina. And I said, well, no, I'll come get you. No, don't, don't, don't come, Dad. <clears throat> well, go to a gas station. I'll give you a credit card. No, Dad, you don't understand. You don't understand. If the voices are telling me, if I step out of this car, I will die. Now, we all know that's ridiculous, but how do you know you're here tonight? How do you know you're listening to me? How do you know you live in Seattle? You know because your mind is telling you, and I'm telling you right now, if all of us decided we'd die if we left town hall, we'd get to know each other better than we'd ever want to because we'd stay right here. So I did what no father should do. I arranged for my son to get gasoline, drive completely psychotic up at 95, went off the road twice, luckily was not stopped. And when he got home, I said to him, look, I've talked to all these experts and they told me that I should be your partner, not your parent work with you, work with the healthy part of your brain to try, what do you want to do? I want to go in a safe house, Dad. I don't want to take medication. I just, take me to this safe house. So I said, okay. So I drove him to a safe house. I checked him in. He got up that night and he took off all his clothes because everyone knows when you take off all your clothes, you become invisible. And he went walking down the street. But listen to what happened this time. This time, a crisis intervention team officer 
saw him and he came up and he said, hey buddy, uh, you're walking naked down the street. That's not really that safe. Let's go over and get you checked out in the emergency room. Don't handcuff me. That's when I got tasered. I, I'm not a criminal. Okay, the officer used his discretion and had him get in the back of the squad car. And then that officer said to him, what kind of music do you like to listen to? Oh, I like rap music. He turned it on to a rap station. When they got to the emergency room, my son actually said, man, this is better than a taxi ride. That officer then didn't leave. He took him inside. And when that doctor said to him, well, walking down the street naked is, uh, you know, that's not a sign of dangerousness. The officer actually said to him, really? Dr. Smith, I'm going to look up where you live and drop him off on your front lawn. All of a sudden, my son was admitted into that hospital. And then a miracle happened. He got a case manager, a fabulous woman named Cindy Anderson. And she said to him, why don't you like taking your meds? And he said, I've gained 40 pounds. I feel sluggish. I can't drink. I can't have sex. And she said, we're going to get you to talk to a psychiatrist. Do you know of my son's seven psychiatrists? Only two have ever bothered to learn anything about him except his name and his symptoms. And that's because they're going to get paid for a 15-minute insurance med check and shove that person out the door for a social worker. To, but treating the mind also requires treating the heart and treating a person like a person, not just some object to be moved along assembly line. And he got a doctor who talked to him, and they became friends, and the doctor worked with him, and they got a medication that he didn't mind taking because he didn't even think he had any side effects. And then the case manager said to him, you shouldn't live with your father. Now, I didn't know quite how to take that. But he said, and I thought, this is silly. I have a big house. He could, no, he's too old to live with you. He needs his own place. So she moved him into housing first, two guys with schizophrenia. And I was shocked. I was shocked at how much that made him proud. He had to pay 30% of his income. Even if he didn't have any, he had to pay it. But it gave him respect. He was an adult. And then she said to him, what are you going to do with your life? Well, what can I do? I have a mental illness. Knock it off. Control the illness. Don't let it control you. So he got a job. He was the grocery or the Home Depot guy who picked up carts. My son with a college education, walking around Home Depot, picking up carts. And he got depressed because all his friends were moving on with their lives and, and doing so much better and having families, and here he was picking up carts. And one day she came by that store, his case manager said, Kevin, you're doing fantastic. And he thought she was mocking. He said, no, come to my group, come see other people. So he came, and he realized he really was. And he went from being someone who needed help to someone who actually was helping other people. And he said, this is fantastic. And she said, I have a perfect program for you. It's called Peer to Peer. A person with mental illness helping people with mental illness. Today my son is a certified peer-to-peer -peer counselor. He works for Arlington County and let me brag on him. A guy over 300 pounds, schizophrenia, hadn't been out of his parents' basement for weeks, months. My son went over started talking to him and they related and after a while my son got him to get out. They went to McDonald's, not my first choice but they got him out of that house. Now that's not a big deal unless that's your son. Today, Kevin and his mother are buying a home together. He's paying taxes and paying and complaining about that. And he's working full time and attending graduate school to be a mental health technician. So don't you dare tell me people with mental illness can't get better. I've seen it with my own eyes. So how do we make this happen? There's only one answer. You look to your left and then you look to your right. I'm going to ask you this question. Who will demand that we stop locking up our loved ones with serious mental illness when their only real crime is they got sick? Who will demand that people with serious mental illness be given opportunities and not stigmatized? Who will demand that insurance companies and our healthcare system treat broken minds the same way they treat broken bodies? Who will insist that prisoners with serious mental illness receive humane treatment and not kept locked up for years in solitary confinement that we know makes mental illnesses worse. And we just had a new study that shows people locked up in serious, with serious mental illness who locked up in solitary confinement die 15 years before their peers. 
And one of the worst offenders is our federal government, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. It holds people with serious mental illness in isolation, not for days, weeks, or even months, but for years. Federal prisoners were confined an average of 896 days, 29 months last year in solitary confinement. And incredibly, 13% of those people who were held for 29 consecutive months in isolation were released right from isolation back into the community without any treatment or help. That's wrong. Who will fight for the homeless psychotic man on your streets, the teen who's cutting herself, the college student hearing voices, the woman standing on the edge of a bridge about to jub? Will you? Margaret Mead said it best, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. My dad was a minister, and right there I've told you a lot. Because what that means is every Wednesday and Sunday I got dragged to church. And I got really, really good at listening to my dad speak and going like this and not hearing a word he was saying in that sermon. But there's always one story he told that got my attention. And that's because it's about a woman who's having sex. They're in the Bible. You just got to know where to look for them, okay? A woman is caught in adultery. It's always the women in the Bible who are get caught in adultery. And she's dragged in front of this mob, and they're picking up stones. They're going to kill her. They're going to stone her. And we read that the teacher picks up a stone, and he says, let ye who's never sinned throw that very first stone. And we read people, put down the rocks, because all of us have sinned. All of us have done things we're ashamed of. My friend Brian Stevenson, a fabulous law lawyer in Alabama, talks about stone catchers, people who stand between the angry mobs and catch those stones until other people can be strong enough to join them. And it's the stone catchers who give me hope because right now we live in a society that doesn't want to put down those stones. They want to lock people up, throw away the key. I am the parent of an adult son with a serious mental illness. What's that mean? It means seeing my son, Kevin, given not a second chance, but a third and a fourth and a fifth, sticking with him until he was engaged and embraced his recovery. Being the parent of an adult son with a serious mental illness means learning about resilience and the human spirit. It means learning from my son, becoming his partner as well as his parents, watching him succeed. What does it mean to be the parent of a son with a serious mental illness? Our journey has given us a purpose in our lives, a passion for trying to help others and advocate. And I am a fortunate father. I have a son I am proud of. And my goal is that other people, other sons and parents can get the same kind of help Kevin's received. That's what I want. That's what you can help me achieve. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being a stone catcher. You can make a difference. Thank you.